<laughs> One more time. Hi, how are you getting on? Welcome to this Apocalypse Clown edition of my podcast, The Tony Cantwell Shit Show. We're talking things all Apocalypse Clown, what you do in an apocalypse, what you like about clowning, all sorts of things. Joining us here today, we have the director of the film, the best film in Ireland, says uh, the Galway Film Fla. We have George Kane, and we have its stars. Joining me in the studio, Fionn Foley. And over in Edinburgh, we have Natalie Palomides. How you doing, guys? Hey, hey very what good. is up? Hey, Tony. Very good, good. Uh, so look, um, I want this to be a free form chat. As I said, I insist this being a very. Ca- I insist this be a very casual chat. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. But I thought maybe we might go around the table, maybe just as a bit of an icebreaker, and talk about what our experience of clowns actually is. There's a lot of clowns ah. in this film. And we all might have a bit of a different yeah. history with clowns. I remember, for example, my first time seeing a clown, just being blown away, going to like Fawcett's or Duffy's Circus, which were all those circuses that would just take over like uh, a car park outside of a church for like a month. Yeah. And there would be clowns. And I just remember just be- my jaw just being on the f- on the floor, seeing clowns wow. just like ridicule parents, you know, like yes. pull their pants down. <laughs> you know, well, the one that I saw, they did, right. it, you know, He's not working uh, anymore. you know, like mimic them and wow. pretend they're like, oh, you know, and just doing everything. And it was everything that I as a kid really wanted to do, mm. <laughs> you know, and take the piss out of my parents. So I remember just thinking this is the most rock and roll shit I've mm. ever seen in my life. Fionn, what was your first uh, experience with the clown? Yeah, I, don't, I, I remember all the same things you're talking about, these uh, kind of Fawcett Circus deals. I don't, I don't remember them having a profound effect. I think I probably, asso- I mean, this is awful thing to say, I think I probably associate it more with the um, the kind of McDonald's thing a little bit and all sure. the kitschiness and sure, sure, sure. Um, like, so in a childhood sense, you know, um, probably was fairly terrified of them like a lot of people. But then <laughs> I also have this weird obsession as a child with like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. So on, on the actual more uh you know uh technical end of it i probably was a bit into clans but didn't know it mm, very much Bam, so bow. um natalie you you've you've uh, obviously uh, the only experienced clown amongst us yes well i don't know about that i mean fion's probably uh, you know he's got he's got some chops <laughs> clown chops probably from watching <laughs> well, buster and, and charlie growing up but when i was a kid i didn't have that experience of thinking that clowns were like super funny like taking taking down the man or anything but we didn't have those kind of clowns in in the states we had like bozo the clown Mm -hmm. which i really loved but he like falls in the category of like scary birthday clowns like kind of in the way he looks sure um so a lot of people are scared of bozo but yeah i kind of struggled with you know my portrayal of the character in this film because (laughs) you know just grappling with perpetuating this negative stereotype of like scary clowns and you know something i've been combating my entire career as a clown and whenever i i i've avoided telling people that what i do is clowning because of the you know uh misconceptions so i just defer to telling people i'm a physical comedian Mm -hmm. um yeah it's like kind of the easiest way to communicate to people kind of what clowning is so they don't imagine like a scary clown or a birthday clown or anything creepy like a pedophile or <laughs> yeah. know, John Wayne Gacy or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a few bad clowns have really ruined it for the rest of us. I want to know who the yeah, guy yeah. pulled people's trousers down. That's not, I don't think that's standard. <laughs> yeah, it didn't seem standard, but, uh, you know, it was just kind rogue, of like rogue element. It was a very rogue element. There was a, you know, we called it jocking here, Natalie. Yeah. There was a good history of jocking. Ah. And, you'd, you know, um, it's kind of like sharking, but for men. You know, you just pull, yeah. you know, um, people don't really have people wear belts a lot more now. You know, yeah. kind of fashion. Oh, yeah. I got my I got pants. To, we call it pantsing. Getting That's good. pantsed. What's I don't get the yeah. connection with that. I don't get the, <laughs> just the name, you know, for <laughs> just, well, George. George, what's yeah, your, your history with clowns or what's the what's the first clown that made an impact on you? I, uh, I think I only just thought of this a few minutes ago, but I think the first clown I was up close with was my dad dressed as a clown. Uh, at a work, a factory open day in, I'd say, 1989. <laughs> and, um, so it was quite strange. He was he was in the baggy pants and kind of a big onesie and full makeup, wig, everything. And he was going around calling himself Bozo, actually. I think. Oh. Uh, but it was just a family cool. fun day kind of thing. But beyond that, I think I went to a cir- circus once or twice. Um, but like Fiona, and I was and still a massive Marx Brothers fan. So I think Harpo Marx is is a clown he's a kind of a legendary clown figure oh, yeah. i think 
Um, so I've loved him, but um, no, I haven't had, I can't say I've had any formative clown contact until the past few years. Yeah, <laughs> quite some intensive uh, clown experience in the last few years. George, yes, can I, I want to ask kind of what, what the original kind of impetus for the idea was. But first, would you say that this film speaks to a kind of disillusioned generation who look at kind of Joaquin Phoenix as a kind of, <laughs> would you say this is a film for them? You know, this kind of kind of uh, people who look at Todd Phillips as Joker and think, right, now more of this clown but, um, taking down the establishment kind of thing. Yeah, yeah that was our impetus to uh, <laughs> No, I, I think um, it's, it's come at a funny time, actually, because because of Joker and two it sequels, you know, it's sort of come back around a bit as an image, you know, the kind of horror clown thing. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I think that this, it started with with the writers who are deck at bounce and they wrote their their play called Clowns and performed at Dublin fringe i think 2010 and we were together making this mockumentary where we chased discovered Ale, or we chased um white snake around uh scandinavia which is called discovered Ale. <laughs> and um it was a it just worked it was a great fun accidental thing we made and uh 10 years ago away we won an award there and we're sort of full of the joys after that thing and what are we going to do next and they said well we've this hilarious play it was very very funny and we just wanted to put those characters into a very heightened, over-the-top, almost Tropic Thunder style situation. And that was the beginning of it. It just seemed, um, the, the material was so good in the play, we just thought these characters are, are the next thing to focus on. Mm-hmm. Um, and originally the guys had played the clans themselves. Um, so that's where it began. When, I mean, I remember when I, when I read the script, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I, when I read the script to, to audition for it, I read it and I laughed. And that made me kind of sad because I was like, oh, well, this isn't getting made now because it's good, you know. I, <laughs> like, I was astonished that it was getting made when I read it. And I was like, this is like the funniest thing I've ever read. But it's so insane and like nothing that they, that I thought would get through the gates, like especially in Hollywood, you know. So I was just like, you know, like big yeah. ups to the, to the Screen Ireland for putting yeah. it through, yeah. you know. I'm was, still slightly stunned it exists, yeah. <laughs> even now. It was a kind of a mythological piece of literature that every actor in Dublin, I remember, had had some... Because I think the script <laughs> went around for a while, you know, so everybody had had... Oh, really? Yeah, everybody was aware of it, obviously, because, you, you, you know, you read it and it's uh, it's not... You're not getting too many briefs that are too similar. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that was a similar thing. Anyone who, who I talked to said, like, I cannot believe that was ever... Uh, brought to fruition in any sense yeah it's yeah. a miracle it's a miracle because it, it is a minor developing miracle. something it has to go through so many people approving it to actually get like to the first stage to the read through to like get funding you know let yeah. alone getting it on onto the big screen so it's just wow i commend you it's guys crazy. With it's an like incredible it's feat went went on a big journey because obviously the beginning of it was was quite different like COVID and that whole period affected it. It started out as sort of these characters on a humanitarian clowning mission in West Africa, completely uninvited, of course. And uh, it was, <laughs> it was a closer to a Tropic Thunder kind of thing. Um, and we, we got close to that at one point. But then when once we hit COVID and filming abroad and it just, it's an ambitious, tricky comedy to put together. We just couldn't quite ever hold on to enough money basically to make it and we started to reassess go, all right how do we make this work in ireland how do we rethink this keep the characters and the structure and and uh i guess the atmosphere of the time in early 2020 it was like post-apocalyptic well oh, yeah. something hilarious, hilarious about that having these characters <laughs> traveling through an apocalyptic irish wasteland uh was was too good and then we just brought it back to screen ireland say so we've rethought it this is what we're going to try and do and they just went yeah crack on <laughs> wow so, so Big ups god bless them. bless them yeah yeah seriously and the fact that they don't like they didn't uh, you know ask you true can we remove the clown pedo set piece <laughs> you know, like, yeah we're just renamed it because it's not it isn't what it sounds which is the whole gag but it isn't just what yeah. it sounds it's really amazing how much they support artists in your country yeah. like it's it's really a uh, I mean, commendable. Yeah, we had a huge freedom. That was the fun thing. I kind of feel like having watched it, you know, with crowds and things, thinking I may never get get this again. The the amount of freedom we had to make this without interference or massive interference, but also to make it with friends as well, make it so close to my hometown. It's like yeah. a very unlikely combination of events, and this is the result. So, um, yeah, I just feel very lucky to have had the chance to do it. Um, but it's it's very idiosyncratic, you know. 
it's it exists it, we thought it was funny we got the chance to make it and hopefully there'll be a lot of people out there agree well, I mean so far there is I mean obviously the best uh, film ever in Irish mm. history <laughs> award you know wow. stands, stands to it <laughs> that. but I mean even I think it was actually it was so weird like it was it was my first day of shooting and we we're all like all in the woods shooting the kind of the festival and and it was <laughs> this is just because I'm so green to like like for big productions that it was only when like the breakfast was there and I was like oh my god it's like sausages and rashers and all here like, and they're not props <laughs> you know <laughs> and like this is legit and I'm like it was only there it was like oh this is the scale it's here yeah. as a breakfast yeah, in, yeah, on yeah. a plate here I realized like oh like they're they are making it yeah. <laughs> like, they wouldn't have brought the caterer <laughs> you know yeah. this is huge it's not just granola bars yeah. you know but we're even through the you looking know, glass here I'm sure we all have experience in things that we've made and really got to practically greenlit and shot and then it's been you know, taken away. So, yeah, it is just yeah. so amazing. Like, Fiona, I know, <laughs> I heard from Ronan Carey that you mm. once uh, tried to commission a sitcom based around Ku Cullen for T.G. Cahar and your <laughs> opening gambit was asking them for one million euro. <laughs> oh, man, I like, I, I believe Ronan. Um, I think we we're all uh, probably a bit green. That's the last thing I thought would be brought up. <laughs> we might have, we have done. I mean, to be honest, like, you know, if you're pitching anything, I suppose that probably is, you know, you're, you're orbiting a number like that. Yeah. Uh, no, there was never any chance of us, uh, like, approaching that. As a, as a, <laughs> I know, yeah. We may have done that, though. There may have been an email with the subject line, one million, <laughs> one million for for this cool thing. <laughs> so like you're in your early 20s, so like un, unproven in, in, you know, screen, yeah, you know, yeah, TV yeah. billing. Yeah. One million <laughs> euro for a cool <laughs> sitcom, you know. Um but, uh, it's like waiting for Guffman. Fionn, how did you, uh, how did you, you're obviously a very accomplished uh, theatre actor, you're a very accomplished actor and writer and composer. How, how did you, how did you kind of, obviously you have a love of kind of, you know, um, you know, kind of early kind of slapstick and silent, com you know, comedians, mm. but how did you actually prepare for your role as, as, as a clown? Um, well, did, did I, you allow I, yourself a time to kind of feed yourself inputs of, uh, of, of, of clowning? Yeah, well, I mean, I would start by saying I did four years of theatre and drama studies in Trinity, which made this whole thing of being a, a wanker uh, <laughs> not, not much of a stretch, you know. So there was kind of, uh, the, yeah, there was uh, fertile soil for, uh, for who Pepe is. Um, yeah. But uh, no, I mean, there's, there's lovely bits of... Um, there are lovely, there's lovely physicality to the character, you know, um, and in a way, had I known more about the actual, you know, craft of clowning, I think that possibly would have taken away from it. Sure. The idea is that he kind of is in love with the the idea of uh, of, of the status of being a clown and like the, the kind of the craftsmanship and the, yeah. the idea that people would have a very high opinion of him with none of the actual groundwork. So <laughs> yeah. it's it was fun to kind of lean into having this big physicality grounded in nothing. Do you know what I mean? So mm. to um and that is yeah I suppose it's like pretty much everyone who's gone to Golier for like a month yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like Golier except no one was there with a the gong telling me to stop. So um, did, did you go to Golier, <laughs> Natalie? Did you have an experience? With I that? didn't, but I got to meet him. Um, at a roundtable discussion about clown with Chelsea and Hillary Clinton. Oh yeah, this was, yeah. It was <laughs> insane. When you sat down with the Clinton and talked clowning. <laughs> I thought that was a bit because I didn't really know you, and I was like, "Oh, this is oh, that's Natalie's whole thing, and she just makes up kind of weird, <laughs> crazy lies." And, no. You know, <laughs> you sat Most down real too. I've ever done. What's what's yeah. his presence like? Because we know, I mean. Uh, Camille uh, did clowning. Camille, Camille Ross, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She she went to Gaulier and I think you know Natalie mm. Corey from Business Casual. He did go. He went to Gaulier. I love Corey. He's yeah, great. a lot of my friends went to. Uh, shout out to Business Casual, Corey Peter Lane. Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of my friends went to Gaulier, but uh, yeah, his presence is like you know sweet and warm, but he just like puts up a, a tough exterior. You know, he's like a grumpy old you know, lovable French asshole. Yeah. Kind of, you know, <laughs> I he kept picture. telling me I was a naughty girl. <laughs> he could tell I was a very naughty girl. And he kept like, you know, and uh, like insinuating that I was fucking my clown teachers and stuff like that. But, um, Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Not all false. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I, I kind of yeah, picture it being Yeah, they did that like, like while we were filming. <laughs> so, oh, really? Um, what were you saying? <laughs> no, I just I kind of I kind of yeah. picture it like you know almost like Wolf of Wall Street. You know, like sell me this pen, but it's kind of like yeah. make me laugh with this pen. You know, yeah. that's how I kind of. Uh, <laughs> view oh right. It, that it's kind of like. Uh, I mean, yeah, that, that is like what happens in clown class. Like, they'll like some exercises are like they'll give you a prop and you have to like make make us laugh or like the hardest clown exercise is when you have to come out with nothing and, and the challenge is, is just to make make us laugh what was what was the worst prop make us laugh thing that you've ever done oh i mean it's usually something very simple or like you could like yeah it could be like a pen um i'm trying to think um one time when i was playing like a a hairstylist uh, like a, a pair of scissors. I mean, I just bombed. I mean, it's so easy to like bomb or flop in clown class because like ugh, it's just really, really hard. Like I, I feel like I'm actually a terrible clown. It's so funny that people think that I'm like whatever, like a well-accomplished clown because I absolutely suck in class. <laughs> you know, I tell people that like, you know, my friends Vigo Venn or Julia Masley are like pure clowns. Or like if anybody's at the Edinburgh Fringe right now, um, Furioso by my friend P.O. Tour, um, which I forget, it's at the Laughing Horse venue, but that that's like a pure clown show and it was like one of the best best shows I've ever seen at the festival. Shout out. I don't know when this is coming out. Anyway. It's just uh, next Tuesday. Yeah, so yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I struggle with like being called a clown because I do wear like a mask as a character, you know, but whatever. It's like so pretty pretentious of me to like get that way about like being precious about like what clown is i i just want people to respect the art and it's like you should know the rules if you're gonna break them you know i feel yeah. like a lot of people have gotten sloppy with clown in the la scene a lot of sloppy clowns around <laughs> yeah myself included <laughs> yeah i feel like when i when i when i find out Pete, some people have like studied clowning it's just like oh like that makes sense it's like they have an extra kind of confidence tool mm. in their arsenal it's like yeah. when you find out someone is actually like a protestant you know and you're like oh i get it that's like, what that's about you know <laughs> it's like oh like your parents were like go for it do it you know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know that's the kind of uh the difference you find that they have confidence coming out of clown school i feel like it usually breaks people well just more so maybe just like they're like kind of maybe like PO, POW prisoners being like, you know, I don't oh, have yeah. any bamboo in my nails right now, so I'm pretty good, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's accurate. That's accurate. George, did you have to do any kind of deep diving? Because, I mean, it is, a, I mean, it's probably down to the, maybe down to the dead cat bounce guys, but even when the attention to detail, even with the, I mean, walking into the makeup trailer every day and seeing it just plastered with so many different yeah. variations, you know, of, of, of clowns across across yeah. the years, you know, some more stereotypical that we're trying to break free of, you know, Natalie and, you know, props for, for yeah, yeah. that up top, <laughs> you know, but, uh, <laughs> but, but did you have to do any kind of deep dive and kind of really kind of watch a, a lot of clowns getting into this? That, it was, it was more um, looking at, I mean, on paper, there was already like four different types of clown in it and that naturally sort of sent in certain directions, but um, yeah, just the makeup looks were going to be so important for everybody because they were wearing oh. them throughout the majority of the film. And I, I felt potentially, because uh, people's aversion to clowns quite often, that it could be a distancing thing to have people in full, full clown makeup all the time. And also it might get in the way of the comedy perversely or this kind of comedy. It might start to feel too wacky. So I kind of thought a lot about that. And, um, you know, David Arrow plays Bobo and he's quite minimal hobo style clown. There's a Emmett Kelly is a famous clown that's his look but it's a very minimal version of it so he's given up you know he doesn't care anymore plus mm -hmm. i didn't want it to obscure david too much and then with Mally was kind of the other end of the scale where we don't know it's like she is just this funzo is this character and has almost never been anything else she hasn't taken the makeup off in years <laughs> the nose has come off in years she sleeps it's in those clothes she's made the clothes herself from stuff she found just wanted to be this <laughs> funzo is just funzo and there is no one else uh, at first um, so that was playing on the it thing the scary clown thing and then filming with Pepe was we had this Belgian makeup team and we knew we didn't want to do the obvious mime thing but they came up with this very striking blue haired look that seemed way too much at first and then um, 
So that's actually, that's let, let, let's go with it. Like, if there's something interesting here, and then we put it on Fionn just to try it, and I was like, oh, it's perfect. And Fionn had an excellent facial hair at the time as well. Yeah. So, so kind like of... a Dickensian pederast, <laughs> just by coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> said, that's our guy. That's our yeah. guy. <laughs> but um, it was primarily that, just having four very different looks, very different styles and costumes, and, and trying to link it to genuine clown history in some way you know it's not just arbitrary thing you know ivan k is the great alfonso so he's much more circus ringmaster kind of you know alpha serious clown um so that was it but i didn't i didn't spend too much time hmm. you know looking at the history and did you i know you're you... asking the questions tony but yeah. i have a i'm curious like how close are the characters in the movie uh to what they were in the original play um no, George, you can ask, uh, well, I hadn't seen it, George. What, what oh, me? You, I, yeah. I, you know, I, exactly the same. I never, I never saw the play oh. live. No, I only read it after the fact. I knew the guys, but I hadn't seen, I think I only got to know them around that time. Oh, so I missed I it live. So I never saw it, but their looks were, were different. Yeah, the, the look was entirely different, um, but still based on a hobo clown, a, a mime and a Camorra That's shock. Very yeah, oh, shock. That's very clown. Yeah, shock. So the looks were unique to the film but the characters were very much what they are except Fonzo is male <laughs> oh right yeah uh, Fiona had you grown your moustache for, for tonic for when you were doing tonic for, uh, uh, yeah exactly and I just kind of uh, weirdly I, I got used to it for a while it was very shocking like it was one of these kind of I think they call it a Van Eyck yeah. so it's like um yeah, I've obviously heard a lot more derogatory names for it since then, but that's the technical <laughs> thing. So by good fortune, anyway, it seemed to work for that and uh, subsequently very little else, of course. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a vibe. You were writing and performing Tonic, which was kind of, it was, you know, had you, you which was an outdoor performance based in the future, based in a kind of also a kind of post-apocalyptic kind of setting. Yeah, yeah, weirdly kind of similar. In, I mean, it, it, there is a kind of a zeitgeist thing sometimes, I think, where um, people are kind of, there, there are just things that people feel kind of compelled to comment on in different ways. But yeah, no, Tonic is a kind of a, a medicine show musical with kind of similar steampunky kind of vibes in the in the Midlands when everything's gone tits up mm. in 2047. So yeah, it was a nice ramp into uh, an even <laughs> more oh, that's insane sick. Apocalypse. I wish I could see that. Yeah, we'll... Uh, Wait, Fionn, that's yeah. not a typical look for you? The, I the, met this you like thing. that. So no, just, you, that couldn't the, be a typical look. The mustache? Look. I don't think you get away with that. I thought that was your look. look. Huh? <laughs> I have a lot of friends who that's their typical look. Oh, really? Mustache. Well, you're in L.A. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the Liberty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you'd be I fine. want to walk you'd be home safely London. at night. <laughs> <laughs> Has no. anyone ever shouted anything at your mustache? Wow. Did you ever get yeah, a... Well, Selick, all right, son, Thompson. No, that'd be far too creative. No, uh, <laughs> people... Um, I notice people feel obliged <laughs> to kind of air guitar at you. Oh, yeah. really? And just, really? You know, really? kind of just a... <laughs> 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 I can't think of anyone that maybe Frank like Zappa with roll. that. Uh, they'd hardly make a Frank Zappa reference yeah. to Liberties, but they're just. Mm. It's always <laughs> rock. You're a rocker. Yeah. yeah hippie. It's always Sing just a song. <laughs> yeah, I was called. One. I still get hippie. I feel like you look more like a man that has crawled out of an organ, not like a. <laughs> Which rather organ? than like a, a rock star yeah I don't know I would more like play air piano at you or something maybe it's just a comment on my general aura or you know the rest of my appearance mm. who yeah. knows you probably get I plume and stuff shouted a lot at you I do yeah. I do my, my namesake my yeah. my viral video Natalie that I had was I oh. said the name the f a funny name called plume mm. I make up a load of so should I look this up right now and watch it? Yeah, you can. Yeah, well, not, maybe not right now. Splice it in. And P L O O N. I don't know. I don't know if the gain is ready for how loud your laughs are going to be. So it might, you might, you might kind of peak the, the sound. Wait, what should I look up? P L O O N. Plume? I mean, you probably could. You probably can get there just by typing in plume. Um, but are you serious? To be fair, there's been uh, a lot more. I typed more in plume Tony, and it said yeah. that it looks like there aren't any great matches for your search. <laughs> it's me scrubs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Are you on yeah. Ask Jeeves? Is that, did, you, did you ask Jeeves for that? Uh, so, George, are you, okay. are, you, are you saying that the the post apocalyptic thing was was a pivot just in the last couple of years, like since COVID? Yes, yeah, uh, about three three and a half years was a pivot. Um, but yeah, I think what as a premise, you're like, I don't know, that sounds mental. And then we kind of looked at the script and realized, I'd say, a good 60, 70 percent of it could still carry over so we had all this great material that could still work mm. um but we just thought I, i've never seen that before you know nobody's yeah. ever made something like this in ireland that we could 
tell. And it just sort of worked. And we were like, all right, let's commit to this. And uh, it seemed more achievable. Um, yeah, elementary could sneak in some 2020 lockdown kind of humor and references. And yeah, it seemed more resonant in some way than what we had planned before. Is there is there any kind of movies that you pulled from for inspiration on, on the look of a kind of post-apocalyptic kind of movie? A little bit, yeah. I mean, we kind of looked uh, at, I mean, Mad Max is an obvious reference. Mm. Um, you know, the kind of wastelands and things like that. But I, I looked at everything, things, because you wanted to do some of the cliches of it, you know, so things like, what is it, The Book of Eli with Denzel Washington and anything that's just over the top dystopian, like the road even. <laughs> um, but just finding ways to kind oh, of bring that out of, yeah. But they're all <laughs> quite bleak, cool. obviously. But then it, the zombie land, you know, so if you look at zombie land, they're traveling across a deserted version of America. So there's a bit of that in there as well. Um, Tropic Thunder was a reference visually as well. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of it really, but also trying to figure out how we could do a cross country dystopian Ireland without going more than 30 miles from central Kildare. <laughs> <laughs> that old chestnut. That, that was the challenge. Yeah. That was the challenge. We got the bog. All you need is the bog. The bog mm. of Allen. You missed that, Tony. No. Uh, yeah. The, the pleasures of the central, yeah. actually the main, our, our main poster that's in cinemas at the moment is is the three clans kind of wandering through the bog of Allen in Kildare a scene that started in the African savannah and then at one point we thought maybe we'll do it maybe we'll do it in the burren no we can't go to the burren okay how can we find the burren in middle in the middle of Kildare and then the bog of Allen existed and it's uh it's crazy it's just so infinite desolate and squishy yeah but, you know, it, it worked for us but I didn't know the place existed I grew up in Selbridge so like Donna D, Forest Park, where you were, Tony, and the lawyer, like it's all local stuff for me. Yeah, I mean, it was... I, I mean, have a it... question about the poster. Oh, go ahead. That's yeah. in cinemas. It looks like everything's set on fire. Do yeah. you think this is misleading at all? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> there's, there's a fair bit of fire in the movie. Um, there is, there is. Spoiler. You saw it. Do you remember um, that movie Rain of Fire that was made in Ireland with Matthew McConaughey and, uh, and Christian Bale? Yeah. The, the poster for that was like flames and dragons fighting helicopters over <laughs> Big Ben at Parliament oh, wow. in London. That was not in the film. Are you serious? <laughs> no, no, there were dragons, <laughs> but there was no Big Ben and helicopter fights. What? And it's notorious. So once we kind of went over the top of the poster, like, is this a bit of a rain of fire over promising? <laughs> but like, don't worry, the car is in it, the clowns are in it, there's fire in it. Things are on yeah, fire. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just not those things. I, uh, I listened to Matthew McConaughey's audiobook, Greenland. Just the Greenland. bog isn't on fire. Uh, yes. <laughs> but uh, Matthew McConaughey said that to prepare for his role in Rain of Fire, he used to go out every night. He used to drink um, whiskey in the morning, you know, like drink like a couple of shots of whiskey in the morning. And He's then such he would, a fucking psycho. And then he would go out and like push cows over, like fuck up cows. <laughs> Cow chipping. <laughs> and he would like... <laughs> And then he's like, he's like, but after I got kicked by my eighth and final cow, I decided this was not the best way of <laughs> preparing for the role. Yeah. You know? What a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, this is fucking up cow. Go cow tipping so you can get into your role? Like, fuck yeah. off. Like, what's the closest idiots. thing to a dragon that I got around here? Cow. Fucking cow, man. Wow. Oh, my God. I suppose you only did eight. I How thought it was for, um... prolific, yeah. Yeah, still a lot of cows to it push is, over. yeah. Well, so obviously, if, if there was an apocalypse, you know, I think it might be fun for a while until obviously we turn to cannibals. Mm. Like if you, I'm sure right. everyone has their kind of fantasies of what they would do if no one else was around in an, an apocalypse. Does anyone, you, we could go around, maybe think of something fun that you'd like to do if there was an apocalypse. <laughs> the first thing you do if there was no one there. Natalie, do you already have one? Um, well, my friend has asked me this before, specifically about zombie apocalypse. Sure. And he said, like, what do you think what you would do? And I said, I, I think I would die. Like immediately, I think I would get eaten by a zombie. I don't think I can run that fast. Yeah, <laughs> and I think one one would get me. So maybe you go to somebody else. While no, I, I think, think no. I mean, I think I would better, instantly better die. I think, I think I would probably yeah. find out about it on the news. My glasses would fall off. I'd step on them, and I'd probably eat a berry and die. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> you know? Eat the run berry. <laughs> die house. of Alma style. <laughs> um. I don't know. I always had this fantasy of just going into like a t-shirt printing shop when no one's there and just making my own t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> my own t-shirt. You wouldn't need the end of the world to do that. I know. It would like, be close. I, I survived. Like Euro. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be the only one when I survived the zombie apocalypse on your yeah. t-shirt yeah. afterwards. It'd be funny. <laughs> wow. 
George, do you have anything fun you'd like to do if you were I, if it was the I, apocalypse that you were left to your own devices? I, I don't know. Well, the quick the question is: Are you trying to are you actually trying to get through it and survive, or are you are you using it as one final blaze of glory to just like you know ride a motorbike off a cliff on fire kind of thing, or mm. do you want to oh, actually, that'd be sick. or do you just want to like shoot zombies and try and get to the other side of it? Well, whatever um, would be more fun for you. you know? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, not a shit ton of I just put my feet up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's gonna, those farmers aren't going to say yeah. shit now. Yeah. <laughs> you read a, a book, George? I did, yeah, it's put my feet up, read a book. Some peace, finally. Yeah, it sounds, yeah. Pretty, sounds pretty good. <laughs> I think I would go hog wild, like slitting people's throat. Like if there was an invasive human species that needed to die, yes. mm. I would go beast mode. I'd mm. be like, oh, yes. Like, I mean, Final. obviously you feel bad killing, you would feel bad killing people, but you wouldn't feel bad killing zombie people. And no. so that would be an opportunity to, to, you know, like do like be in your own action movie. <laughs> I'd say if I killed one and it didn't feel crazy, I think I'd probably yeah. cry and be like, oh my God, this is, you know, like yeah, I thought I had more humanity and soul. <laughs> and, then what would stop you, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, and then what would stop me? What about you, Fionn? I, I, I think I know what would happen. I, I could like, have a fantasy of what how I'd like to react to those situations. But you know that film, the Lars von Trier film, Melancholia. Yeah. And there's like a yeah. big planet that's coming towards the Earth, and everybody has different theories as if it's going to hit or pass, and all this thing. And Kiefer Sutherland in it plays this guy that has a, a solution for everything and a rationale right up until like the eleventh hour when the planet is there, and he goes up and kills himself. <laughs> that would be me. I would be <laughs> trying to calm everyone, saying I saw this news article that yeah. said it's going to be fine, and then I just know, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I that's actually crime. so. It's so funny because I uh, that uh, Liam Neeson movie, The Grey, where he's just mm. like it's like alive, okay. but the wolves are wolves are chasing them, and it's a great movie. I love it. But there's a bit where like you know they're getting picked off one by one, and then eventually this guy who'd been the kind of loudmouth kind of guy, you know, who had not really been taking it that seriously, had been laughing, saying you know no skin off his nose kind of thing, mm. gets to the point he just sits down on a log, and Liam Neeson's like, "What are you doing? We gotta go." And he's all like, "I'm tired. No, I'm gonna let them take me." <laughs> And I'm like, <laughs> that'd be me like half an hour in, you know, just kind of let them. <laughs> just feel represented in film. Yeah, yeah just kind of, I'm just going <laughs> to let them take me. Um, Natalie, I, w I was curious about, uh, because as I said before with the clowning thing, I probably should have brought it up then, but just with the kind of superpowers that I think some people have when they have that in their kind of, their toolkit. Are there any yeah. kind of principles that you implement, like fundamental principles that you implement even in today day to day life or, or in performance, oh. say that with your directing? Uh, the Amazing Banana Brothers. I mean, is there any kind of elements there oh. that you would instill? Thanks for the shout out for Banana Brothers. Um, yeah, Guardian. there's so many elements of clown that are just helpful in life. I think the one that is probably like the most universal and can help everybody out is that you find your success in failure. Ooh. Like, so your good material you find by failing on stage. Um, and so like, in clown or like if you go to Goyer, he'll say like the flop is the most important part of clowning like the flop like when you're dying when you're bombing on stage because that's when you'll have an impulse to try to save it so that's like where most clowning comes in is like what is your impulse to save the show here and like that's usually when you find your most genius or like when you find your gold gold idea or your most genius idea um so I would say like I apply that in life by just like knowing that that fail only good can come out of failure, you know, mm. um, and and the real mistake is is giving up after you fail. So the clown is always the optimist. So they teach in clown classes is that the your clown or the clown is the person in class who's always raising his hand even though he's getting the answer wrong every single time. He's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, next question. Oh, I know, I know. So um, just always remaining the optimist, I think is important, even though you're the stupidest person in class. <laughs> and um, something that I also love about clowning is the idea that stupidity is beautiful. So like something that us clowns all say to each other as a compliment is that was so stupid or that was so fucking dumb. <laughs> and you're such an idiot. It means like, <laughs> You're a genius. You're amazing. That was a brilliant bit. Um, so, um, like a note that I'll always give to Bill, like when he's doing Amazing Banana Brother. Well, I actually don't really have to give this note to Bill, 
most of the time when I'm noting him, I'll say that was so stupid. Like, great. That was, that was really, really dumb. But, <laughs> um, like something that I could say to him if I wanted him to like work on a bit is like, make that, make that stupider. Like, how can you make that stupider yeah. or, uh, but I guess like, yeah, yeah. That's Do you think then, <laughs> no, that's Nat- Natalie, is there a difference between stupid and silly? Are they the same thing? Um, uh, yeah. I think stupid is more surprising to people because mm-hmm. it's like your own specific way of like not being able to like uh, fix the situation or achieve um, what you're trying to achieve. Whereas like silly just... Um, is kind of maybe like what birthday clowns do, like honking their nose and like just being silly. It's like kind of like cringy or like uh, expected. Mm -hmm. I think silliness is expected where stupidity is surprising. Stupid. Good. That's great. Interesting. I'm embroidered on a pillow. I've never really thought about that before. That's just mine. That's great. Yeah, yeah. First thing off the top of my dome. Yeah. That's great. And one, I was curious as well because when I've seen you perform live, um, you've got great, you've got great pacing. You know, like there's always, there's kind of never a dull moment. Is is there any of that that comes from, mm. from clowning in in terms of the the pacing or the tension? You know, or does that maybe come oh. from just experience of reading a room? I mean, well, a big part of clowning is that the audience is always there with you, and you're supposed to stay sensitive to the audience and always listen. There's there's um, an exercise that you do in beginning clown classes where um, one of your classmates will choose like a pose. They'll strike a pose and you're behind the curtain and you don't see the pose that they're choosing. And when you come out from behind the curtain, you're supposed to guess like exactly how they were standing, like what position their arms were in, etc. And the class will clap as you get closer to the position, like a hot and cold kind of game. And you won't get any reaction if you're very far off. So it just teaches you to listen to like how the audience is reacting and I think when you're in tune with the audience and listening if they're laughing or not, you know if you need to, you know, have an impulse, surprise them. So it's like if they're really quiet, it's like, is that intentional? Or are you trying to build tension? And if it's not intentional, like how are, what's your impulse and what are you going to do to try to save save the audience from your excruciating performance? <laughs> you know, how are you going to save them from your how bad you're being um, from boredom. Yeah. That's but uh, it's really important for clowns to like be in tune with their audience and like recognize when they're losing it. Otherwise you're just, yeah. I mean, you can see some really bad clowning in Edinburgh and Los Angeles and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's because they haven't learned to like listen yet. Mm-hmm. Hey. And they keep going on with their same bad bit that nobody's liking mm. instead of adjusting and changing it. Mm. So that's what the clown teacher is there for to honestly just let you know when I'm going, I'm going on and on and on. But <laughs> that was great. Your clown teacher is just there to let you know when you're dying because you haven't like trained that muscle yet. So like a good clown teacher really won't give you too much during class. Like they don't give you ideas or anything like that. It's just like, Hey, do you hear that nobody's laughing right now? <laughs> Save it. Save it. Or, like, sometimes people will do something really great that the audience loves, and they get a huge laugh, and they don't do it again. Mm. They don't build on it again. So the, the teacher's job is to be like, we loved you when you did this. Go back mm. to that. Build on that. Yeah. Mm. Uh. That's great. Well, actually, George, with that like in mind, in terms of like pacing, because what you, I suppose, had when you were looking to turn this into a, a movie was you know, a play and unlikely. I mean, was was the heart that the movie has, was that kind of in the play? I mean, I imagine having a bunch of clowns and a bunch of clown gags and then actually to spread that out for an hour and a half and make the audience kind of yeah. travel with you, like it has to have heart. I mean, it is chock full of gags, you know, but I mean, yeah. it, it, it doesn't, it never feels overwhelming because there's always a journey and it's always very well paced, you know. How, how did you find yeah. taking the, the pieces of that and making that cinematic? Well, it's it's interesting because the 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 tone of the the writers, Deca Benz, and we've worked together like ten, fifteen years now. They they're quite arch in their jokes, and they they constantly try and undercut any moment of sincerity <laughs> or yeah, warmth or like. There's a lot of it's funny. Like it's a very kind of colorful, accessible 
endearing film in a lot of ways but there's a lot of cruel jokes in there there's yeah. a lot of dark twisted psychological material in there and uh, I think that's that's really interesting so for me uh, apart from the casting which was key to that but also just making sure that even the characters on their small journeys you do care about them as awful as they are these people you still kind of want them to succeed and uh, that's key because otherwise it's sort of an intellectual exercise I think if you don't mm. care a little bit about the journey of, of the characters and them succeeding and their, their mission um, you're not going to hold it's not going to hold people so my thing is is to as much as I love that kind of humour is to make sure that sometimes you just lean into the the hero moment if you need a real hero moment don't mm-hmm. undercut it all the time sometimes you need that little payoff at the right story beats and the right moments of the script um, to keep people holding on but it's great to undercut it because <clears throat> in this movie these characters learn nothing you know and that was it's <laughs> yeah. like a it's, it's like the Seinfeld, Seinfeld no hugging yeah. no learning thing yeah. or, or the end <laughs> Again, I said waiting for Guffman earlier, but that's something I always reference because those characters have learned all the wrong lessons okay. at the end of that movie. <laughs> and I love that idea where you're like, no, this is, no, you're going the wrong direction yeah. uh, despite everything you've been through. Um, but they have grown in that they've become great friends. They've become, mm-hmm. they, they, their friendship, friends they made along the way. But yeah. I guess they believe, they believe in themselves more mm. um, and they've renewed their dreams. Uh, whether or not they're the right dreams to have is another question, but yeah. Um, so it ends on a strange up note that's also kind of bleak at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's that was part of me. Uh, I guess my influence on the script to some degree would have been that. But I do think it's very well balanced like that because, and it's it's balanced I think in the right way where it does lean into the joke more. And I think, the, I mean, we've probably seen a lot of scripts, comedies, uh, you know, supposed comedies, you know, been published in in or being made in in Ireland that are that are leaning more into the dramedy kind of side of things, you know, okay. and, you know, actual comedy, comedy. I think that's probably the main reason that I thought this is never getting made because there's a couple of jokes on every page. Yeah. And it isn't, you know, it isn't, it isn't a dramedy, you know, it isn't like, you know, someone comes back, moves back from London and uh, their friends are alcoholics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's, you know. Do you think, I think there's some broad tre- trend in that though, in, in comedy cross the Ireland, uh, England, UK, and, and America as well is that um, people need a, sort of a core issue or social yeah. issue as part to it now, or or it's like got a strong emotional sad calm kind of thing to it. Um, the out and out just joke, joke, joke comedy is very rare. Like there's some TV yeah. shows that do it. Arrested Development was a while ago now, but that kind of show doesn't seem to be as as popular for commissioners and and people anymore. And you look at Hollywood comedies. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> People love but, it. But think the past 10, 15 years, 20 years, Hollywood comedies, like y- your anchormans and things like that are incredibly silly and Zoolander. So, but they're not, they're thin on the ground these days. Yeah. And, and all the top 10, 20 comedies of all time and all those polls are always things like The Jerk and even Life of Brian and, mm. and Mel Brooks stuff. And they're the things that seem to last, but there's a different naked gun. But the attitude or the appetite for that stuff uh, is still out there, I think. But, people don't take a chance on it for some reason i don't know why and oh, i feel yeah. that's that's where this sits in the in the in the tradition of those out and yeah. out ridiculous fast silly joke packed it's just about a fun time and laughter and there's sure there's heart in it and, and all the important things but um i miss that and i miss do, seeing those films in a room of 200 people at a cinema mm-hmm. and hearing everybody crack up like it's so rare these days i guess because people watch it on streaming now mm-hmm. but um that's my dream for this is that people will just go and just give in to the nonsense and uh, and have a great time mm. i think it's set, that was it's a great pitch shouldn't it it's 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 set a precedent i mean there is no kind of precursor to i think a film with this in an yeah. irish context i always wonder uh, is it and maybe it's the same everywhere but it feels like maybe the elements of of film and tv are kind of not bridged with stuff like theater with clowning with comedy in ireland as much as they maybe are elsewhere and therefore mm. you get um storylines or concepts that are inherently filmic and inherently dramatic in narrative whereas you know something like this and an awful lot else you know the the engine for the whole thing is the comedy and mm-hmm. the style and the fantasticalness of it so yeah hopefully i mean i think yeah this this is uh, something that'll hopefully be a catalyst for sequels if nothing else yeah. <laughs> have you thought about well, that I hope, I mean, you know you, you want you want more have we talked about sequels yeah mm. Of course, <laughs> yeah. of course. Yeah, you're just like, you know, I, I do genuinely, I don't know what, what the plans will be, but I think these characters can definitely run and run. It's just a really excellent trio. And um, 
yeah, it'd be great to do more with it. And I think a lot of the stuff we kind of left behind with the old version of the movie is still, I still think it's hilarious. And, uh, you know, I don't think we want to say goodbye to him just yet. Mm. That's great. That'd be fun. It would. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe TV, maybe lives on TV. Um, well, I you know, know, yeah, you look at the Young Offenders, you know, had a, a great run in cinemas. And then what's series five now? Series four or yeah. five? It's uh, still going, yeah. You know, so yeah yeah there's the shooting uh, i think at the moment so it's a it's an idea um i'll get on to tg carter and uh, just <laughs> <laughs> one million dollars please Seven hundred fifty thousand. i'm so sorry about the million Seven hundred and fifty thousand for this i was hacked i was picturing i was picturing you walking into tg carter like james cameron you know a story about aliens we walked into <laughs> the studio and wrote the word he wrote the word alien on a whiteboard yeah and then he turned around and wrote an s at the end and drew a line down the middle of it like and that was his pitch <laughs> aliens <laughs> with a <the> dollar sign. <laughs> look at him now and that was you Genius, and tg carter yeah, look at him now, smug about uh, the horrors of, <laughs> of deep yeah, diving. That's his latest I thing. I told you all <laughs> it was going to happen. It is insane how everyone after that was all like, do you know there was three different types of material in that sub? Be like, what are you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sub, some nautical engineer. <laughs> everyone yeah. thinks they know. It's grim. Um, <laughs> George, where, will, where, can people, where are people going to be able to see the film? Obviously, it's going to be released September 1st in Irish cinemas. Yes, September 1st, our cinemas. Um, uh, the list is still adding up at the moment, but it'll be in the in Dublin, the IFI, in the Lighthouse, and like movies at Drum, Dundrum and that kind of chain of cinemas and beyond. Uh, it could be playing in Belfast as well at the Odeon. Um, yeah, they're still being confirmed as well, but it'll be it'll be most places. Um, so if you fancy it, start you know, looking it up. and uh, <laughs> there'll, be, there'll be some advanced tickets, I think, coming out in like a week beforehand. Mm. But um, it'll be around... And also, if you like oh, wow. the idea of there being a comedy that has jokes in it, like joke mm. jokes in it. Actual jokes. Know, and you want to support that and set a precedent, maybe turn the tide forever on comedy. Who knows? Who's to mm. say? Who's to say? Yeah. <laughs> but it could happen. It may change the world. It may change and the Tony, world. I will say, Tony is hilarious in it. So yes. if you like Tony, come see it. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. What it, what was, what I it? love I kept quote, Tony's line is my favorite line in the whole movie. And <laughs> I do continuously quote it still to this day, as I did on set every time I talked to you. Go on, do your South <laughs> South County Dublin accent there. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. Okay, fair, fair. Is it in the Is it in the trailer? Uh, it's not in the trailer. This is our boutique festival. <laughs> <laughs> we are not afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hey. Nat- I have an idea. So Natalie, you're you're dire- you're currently directing the amazing Banana Brothers, and you have a work in progress in Edinburgh. Would you like to give that a plug? Yes, I would love to give it a plug. So I actually just added a show on Monday that I'm doing to help fund the Adam Brace Award. Um, it's honoring uh, my late friend and mentor Adam Brace, who was um, a very uh, interwoven and important director here. Um, in Edinburgh and in London, um, he directed many, many comedians, shows and uh, plays. And so uh, we're, um, we're all getting together and putting some funds together for an award in his name. So the show I'm doing on Monday at Monkey Barrel in Hive One at uh, 13, or wait, not 1305, 1905, at 1905 um, is called We're Work in Progress, W-E-E-R. And then I'm doing shows Thursday through Sunday with um, Lucy Pearman. And uh, we're each doing a half an hour of work in progress. So if you can't make it to the hour on Monday, come see me and Lucy uh, Thursday through Sunday. Also at Monkey Barrel in Hive One at noon. Thank you. Very for the, cool. Very cool. That. Fionn, when can yeah. we see your short film that premiered at the at the FLA? It's doing the rounds, hopefully. Um it's in the Aesthetica Film Festival in New York, if anyone's listening from there. Um, but hopefully it'll, <laughs> it'll, you know, it'll do the rounds the next year or so. I think it might be on on the airlines at some point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, um, very cool. Yeah. 
it's big. Yeah, I can see that. Air Lingus, yeah. when you get that, the, get that sweet, sweet. Well, it may not be Air Lingus. Oh, I think it might be. <laughs> I'm, I, I shouldn't speak. I have no <laughs> idea, actually. Okay. Uh, is, is, is there anything else you'd like to plug at this point? Um, no, I, I'm, uh, I kind of moonlight as a, a writer, composer. So um, I have an adaptation of Roddy Doyle's The Giggler Treatment on as the Christmas show in the Ark. Oh, one real. Any, if you, any children are listening. Oh, <laughs> class. This is the um, so that's the next <laughs> next thing. You know what would be fun? Every time I ask you what you're doing, you tell me like you're in the process of doing something, and then it always shows up. You're not like, <laughs> like you're you're not a bullshit. You're like I'm working this thing. Yeah. And, uh, it's always like oh, I'm doing this thing, and it'll be available in a few months' time. You're always yeah, you're, yeah. you're very good at just like doing. The, well, I'm, I'm contractually obliged to deliver it at this point. So <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the road, they had an Aer Lingus thing may not come to pass so there's that that's fine look I can cut out the Aer Lingus <laughs> thing <laughs> send me a link send me a link um, okay guys look thanks very much go see Apocalypse Clown it's going to be on the Prince Charles Cinema uh, the 30th uh, screening I believe in, in London this is uh, our independent film <laughs> that's um, <laughs> we're not afraid <laughs> and we are not afraid we're not afraid <laughs> sorry did I cut you off Tony no no I was, just, I was saying the same line as you uh, mm. okay great <laughs> look, okay. thanks very much for <laughs> For listening to the pod, all the best. Bye-bye.